I feel like my driving style is also that way. I drive the car into the corner until I hit that limit. And because of what I grew up doing, I've been able to drive myself out of it more times than not. So I just feel like I kind of applied that to everywhere we go, road courses, short tracks, whatever it is, I always go past the limit, find it, okay, there it is, and try and stay under it. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour, presented by NASCAR on Fox. We encourage you to listen uh, anywhere that you get your podcast. Follow us on YouTube or at Harvick Happy Pod anywhere on on social media. And today's interview is with Tyler Reddick. And for me, this is a a young driver that has a whole bunch of uh, a potential to do the things that he wants to do on the NASCAR Cup Series circuit. He's last year's winner at COTA, um, won back-to-back NASCAR Xfinity championships in 2018 and 19. And I just, I love the way that Tyler drives. Uh, I think he's very creative in the way that he gets through traffic. He can run the wall like a beast. And he is, um, in, in my opinion, in a much different place than he has been before he, than where he was before he went to 2311. So I, I like the fact that, that Tyler presents himself with confidence, whether it's in his shoes or uh, the awesome paint schemes that he drives on the racetrack. I just think Tyler's in a great spot. So let's listen to the interview and I hope you enjoy it. Well, thanks for coming. Absolutely. I apologize. I apologize early for um, my amateur interviewing skills, but I've, uh, I've gotten better. We've taken notes. It, you got, well, you got I, I do have down, some right? notes. I had to wear my glasses so I could. Last time I last time I started with Kyle Busch, I wrote my notes so small that I couldn't see them. <laughs> so my notes are my notes are bigger this time, and they always find us somewhere cool to go. So tell me about your year, because from my standpoint, when I look at you and I hear you talk and I watch your race, it seems to me like you expect to win everywhere that you go now. Because I hear that frustration, and I know that frustration because. When, when we were so dominant in our cars and you showed up to the racetrack, the only thing that you thought about was, was winning. And you knew that you could do it. You knew that your team could do it. Is that, is that a correct assessment of, of where you and your team are right now? Yeah, it's pretty dang accurate. Yeah, it, the last two weeks have been, have been rough post race. I mean, I guess, yeah, the last two weeks have been kind of rough post race for sure. Yeah. It's, it's, a wild, it's a wild thing because I remember back three or four years ago, or even just my rookie year, right? Like I was over the moon, excited, like real high-fiving each other if we got the top 15, right? Yeah. And now if we can't, you know, I mean, like anything but winning is just, um, it, it's weird how that changes. Yeah. I gotta, it's something I'm gonna have to kind of balance, right? I mean, the last two weeks were, were great weeks. Like it isn't until like I get to talk to Billy afterwards on like Mondays, like, we went from like 18th and points to fifth over the last two yeah. weeks and all these other things that are really important, right? But uh, yeah, as a race car driver, points are great. Getting yourself set up for this, you know, for the regular season stretch is good, but we all do this to win, right? So right. That, that's the part when you can't capitalize, that's frustrating. Yeah, so you, you've won championships in the Xfinity Series. You've won races in, in the Cup Series and then you make the switch and you go over to to 2311 and pair up with Billy and Denny and Bubba and everybody, everybody over there, you go right in and, you know, I think everybody expected you to go over there and do well. And, and I, I think when, when I watched this year, it's like you went through last year and said, okay, we know we can do it now. We go into this year. So, so when you, when you have those moments, like you did the last couple of weeks and you're, you're racing with, with Larson and, and then last week you're racing with Denny, how do you how do you get over all that? Are you a, are you a quick are you a quick get over it guy or are you a guy that dwells on it and thinks about it constantly and has to be your, your crew chief has to come in and say, look, man, knock it off. We've had a great week because I heard I heard Chris tell that to Denny last week. He said, hey, I don't know if you've heard this, but he yeah. gave him a speech on the radio that I thought was was pretty cool. And, and a lot of people a lot of people don't realize the 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 mental communication that comes between. Usually it's the driver crew chief. Is Billy that guy for you, your crew chief? Yeah, he was, um, I mean, we didn't really talk about the situation a lot till like post-race for sure, but it, it, uh, 
pretty pretty quickly once we lost that track position, I was I was getting pretty frustrated. Yeah. Um, I was encountering some some drivers that were basically just running my line the last you know eighty laps and yeah. just kind of got stuck. So that that is, that gets you frustrated, right? When you know that, especially in my situation, I watched Christopher restart behind me, drive by me, and I'm like, okay, if I can just stay with him, maybe I can be close to him and figure out what he's doing, whatever it was. And I watched him just drive away and I got stuck behind the people he just cut up through. So uh, that can get very frustrating. But yes, I think Billy was a lot more quick to to get me to snap out of it this week uh, because he was pretty freshened up on how to handle it based off of Vegas last week. Yeah. I was I was pretty tore up about it, to be honest. Yeah. Both weeks, it, it, it looked to me like you had a pretty versatile car. Yeah, and yeah. early in the race at Phoenix, you found that middle lane, third lane. Yeah, I found it, it too early, honestly. It, I, know. I went up there and ran it, and then I'm like, it, it was, I was hoping it was just going to be like break even. I was going to save it for once. I got a little closer to Denny, yeah. but it was like two or three tenths faster. It was like, a lot. Well, I might as well just go back to the bottom because I know the next lap he's going to go up there, and he did. And, you know, so I just, I just waited for a little bit longer to, to use it again. I guess I didn't actually use it to, to pass those cars maybe the 43 it was the apron in, in one apron. and two yeah yeah there's the you know i think you're pretty familiar with how to use it but yeah that was not apron christopher pretty much schooled us on how to properly use it uh last sunday um, yeah in the moment i didn't know how much faster he was i didn't know he was you know eight seconds back and just running him down. insane laps so i think uh there's something to learn from that for sure you know i i think it's denny kind of me and denny talked about it some like i think what he did there is some of its car, but a lot of it could, I mean, potentially just be technique, right? So it's something we'll certainly be trying to be more in tune with when, um, you know, we return. So is Denny, is Denny also in this, in this process on a week to week basis? Because from the outside looking in, you listen to Denny and you, and you hear him talk and you hear him, you hear him say all the things that he says and, and always mixing it up and stirring it up. But he seems like, a very involved leader. Yes. Is, is he somebody, is that a correct assessment that is, of that yes, situation? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's always sitting in the meetings, always giving his feedback on me or Bubba's day, or just kind of like how he thinks the race played out or just just shedding a light in his, you know, his opinion on, you know, who made the right calls or what strategy played out. Like he just, when you've done it as long as he has, and you know this, you just, I think you look at it a little bit differently than maybe myself or, or Bubba would, you know, he's just, has a lot of experience. That's good to have. Regard. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe not necessarily so much after Phoenix, but like, you know, Vegas and how I was racing Kyle and all that sort of stuff. There was a lot of good tips he gave me there. Um, I didn't know if he was going to give me grief about uh, when we got together in, in turn one and two, but um, we definitely didn't get better as the race went on. And I think some of the damage we got from that's been kind of set us back a little bit. When I owned, when I owned my race teams, I, my wife was never more mad at me than she was in, in uh, Canada one year. I drove in and I was like seventh and it was one of those moments where it was just drive in there and just push the guy in front of you hoping for, for something to happen. Well, the something that happened was uh, spinning my own two cars out. I was driving for RCR and spun those two cars out. And the next thing you knew, uh, Robbie Gordon and um, Marcus Ambrose had run into each other and they had black flagged Robbie Gordon. He spun Marcus Ambrose out and I wound up winning the race. And I was standing there. Uh, in victory lane and my wife and and josh are sitting on the wall and i'm, I'm thinking to myself well why, why don't they come over here they wouldn't speak to me and she was so mad at me for for a long time and and um but i always i always thought that that was um that was one of my favorite wins just because of the fact that that i was able to to beat my own cars spin my own cars out and it was the perfect tool to, to tell somebody you would do whatever whatever you had to do to win, yeah. how would that how, how do you think that would go over is that is that what denny expects from I, I, I've, I've got the feeling pretty early on from Bubba that, you know, he tries to use Denny's ownership in the team against him. Yeah. Um, I try to save it for when it matters. What do you mean right? by that? Use it against him. Well, like, you know, if you're in Denny's shoes, right, you don't want to tear up your own car and you don't want to wreck another one of your own cars, right? Because yeah. I, I feel like he's, he's aware with how expensive this stuff can get, right? Yeah. So I'd wreck the crap out of my cars <laughs> if I had two to win. I would just. I mean, it. I've I've never honestly felt like Denny's really ever cut me breaks or been like more fair with me. He races really yeah. hard, but uh, you know, I feel like it's something that's kind of shared amongst, I'd say, majority of the Toyota drivers that right. we all race each other 
probably at like the 95th, 95th percentile and don't go any further than yeah. that because it's not worth taking that risk and having something go wrong. Kind of like it, it unfortunately did. I think, you know, Denny's situation, I knew his car was pretty loose. He'd been kind of fighting it. Uh, I think it just kind of surprised him that yeah. when that happened. Yeah, he just he just lost it. But I think it's a I think it's an interesting conversation because of the of the fact that um, I mean, it's just there's it's so hard to pass and race and do mm-hmm. all the things that you need to do. So when you get that position, yeah, it's like I, I don't think it, I don't think for, for me, I would just kind of black out and lose my mind and, and just do whatever whatever I had to do. But it's it's such a different it's such a different world. And with the with the Toyota thing, you came from the Chevy side of things, and, and you stepped into into the Toyota camp, and you've got Denny in the middle of that. You've got Gibbs on the other side. How's that different from from where you came from the Xfinity side to what you stepped into at, at Toyota? Well, I think you know, I mean, just the the number the, the big thing is the technical alliance with Joe Gibbs Racing. Um, you know, we're we're always sitting down every Monday and debriefing our races together, all all six cars, and just hearing Denny talk about it, hearing. Martin's opinion on it. Like I've, I've known Martin, right. Mm -hmm. But, but getting to in that setting, hear his feedback, obviously you got Ty, who's like newer to it. He's kind of trying to learn as much as he can from others, but he's, he's pretty sharp at understanding what his race car is doing. Um, and then you have Christopher who always, you know, finds a way to extract speed out of a car like he did on Sunday. And, um, it was just getting an understanding what, what the drivers like for feel and just kind of what the mindset of, of the crew chiefs are. It just, it feels like we have a pretty good balance of staying close together, but when we do get adventurous, it's in these areas that, that kind of benefits us all. So are you an SMT guy? Do you study? Are you into the data? I try not you, to study super hard. I mean, you talk about all the drivers yeah. being, being together. You have a lot of options to look at for the whole field. Is it, yeah. is it something that you dive into? Well, I mean, I feel like if you're going to compare SMT, you know, obviously there's a time and a place to look at who the fast car may be mm-hmm. if it's you know, Kyle or, or, or Byron or whoever it might be, right? Blaney. But um, I feel like in most cases, it's always best to first compare to another one of your cars, right? Another right. Camry, because you just don't know what the body build might be of the Ford or of the Chevy, right? And that can be a difference in what the capability of the car is. So I always like to compare to those first. But uh, I feel like over the last like two or three years, I used to go nuts watching hours and hours and hours of yeah. in-car film, whether it was like you at Atlanta trying to figure out how to run the bottom or like Martin Trex at, at Kentucky or, or some of these other racetracks, right, where I've really dove into it. I've tried not to overdo it at, at times, and I feel like Denny and, and everyone 2311's really built up a really good system to where we can like efficiently hit all the really big stuff, mm-hmm. and then they do a good job of kind of putting together details that I can go through and I can kind of get 90% of the way prepared in, in about an hour's time. So they do a really good job making it efficient for me. Um, and then from there, you know, it's kind of up to me how much extra, you know, I want to really put into, the, yeah, into was, that or put somewhere else. I was never one that would spend a lot of time because I think you have, you have your own style. And when I watch you navigate traffic and it's like last week, you would go up the racetrack, diamond it. And I think I said it a couple of times. I'm like, oh, he's in there too far. Next thing you know, it's a diamond and you're coming off the corner a car and a half. No, I mean, nine, mo- more than likely when you're saying it was too far, I probably ended up too far. Yeah. I just, my car was good enough to get me out of it. That's in, okay. In that situation. Hey, sometimes, you, whether you have a good car or a bad car, you take advantage of the good cars while you can. But you still seem like, um, and I, I would compare you and Larson. Like I watched the end of the end of the Vegas race and it was like a chess match. And it was like yeah. it was like a chess match and, and you went to the top and started gaining ground and, and in three and four and, and got there at the end. And then it became that match of air block and all the things that, that come with, with today's racing. But I view that as a, as a dirt thing because you have to move around the racetrack and, and find the line. Is that, is that something that you think you were good at in dirt and or something that you were taught? Because it seems like it's, it's obviously carried over for both of you to this car to be able to run high, run low. But even last week at, at Phoenix, it was uh, in deep, shallow, on the apron, diamond, up at the top, down at the bottom. Is that, is that something that comes with your background? Because I think a lot of people don't give you enough credit for running the fence and being able to do the things that you do in traffic like they, like they do Larson. So I, I, think it's, I, think it's, um, I think it's one of your strengths of, of how you get to the front and the way that you drive the car because you're creative in what you do. And it seems like that's something that you've done your whole career. Or were you taught I, that? 
I, I think there's, there's, there's a bit of both. Um, I think at the start when I, when I came over to asphalt, I was just so bad at hitting the bottom of the racetrack lap yeah. after lap. I would just have to find something else. Um, I was never really good at running the bottom when I ran dirt. It was, I always would tend to find speed the higher I'd run on the racetrack. Mm. And racing dirt, that, that meant finding moisture through the middle of the racetrack that would kind of spray up off the bottom or, or going up and running on the cushion if it was there on that given night. So yeah, I think, yeah, some of it is just what I grew up doing. I think probably a lot of the similarity that you're pointing out between me and Kyle comes from, you know, we, we both grew up racing outlaw carts in California and uh, you had to be really, really aggressive with the vehicle, with the cart, and you had to be ready to change your line at a moment's notice because you just never know when someone's gonna, gonna get ready to throw a slider on you. So I think, uh, you know, some of the air stuff, I got a little bit of a hint about it when I was racing late models. Mm -hmm. That was kind of in that era where, you know, the clean air, dirty air, the, the, fl the floatiness of the nose in traffic was really starting to become more prevalent in, in late model racing. So some of it was, you know, a product of just my background. And then I had to really work on it a lot. I feel like, um, through trial and error, once I got into the trucks, cause I feel like when I got truck racing, I was, I was way too early. I'd always jump up out of line way too quick to the top and lose like five, six yeah. spots. Then I get it going and then someone would jump up. Right. So, um, it just, I think it's just through trial and error, you know, I feel like my driving style is also that way. I drive the car into the corner until I hit that limit. And because of what I grew up doing, I've been able to drive myself out of it more times than not. So I feel like I've kind of applied that to everywhere we go, road courses, short tracks, whatever it is, I always go past the limit, find it. Okay. There it is. And try and stay under it. So you went from, you went from dirt. Tell me how you got to the asphalt. Piece oh my of it. gosh. Um, so Schrader this is how Schrader. I got the asphalt piece of it. Yeah. Ken Schrader. Uh, Ken Schrader. Yeah. Yeah. We're racing late models together. He was, you know, he was doing some modified stuff, but he drove my car in the prelude one year. Kind of, I'd gotten to know him from running at his track at, at I-55. And it was back when he was, I feel like a lot of the modified stuff he was doing was pairing up with the late model stuff I was doing at the right. time. So just built that relationship up. And he asked me if I wanted to give asphalt a try, hop in his car and, and go race it. And I, I think for me, um, <laughs> I was like, okay, but I think, I think our first race was in Mobile, Alabama, and that was like my first asphalt race ever. And I just got, I got smoked the first two was times he with I you? did it. Yeah, oh, wow. uh, I think he, he was definitely there. Um, Mobile didn't go great. Then we went to Salem and it went a little bit better. I think I only got lapped once at Salem, ran sixth to Busher who won it. And then um, we went to Rockingham. And for whatever reason, that place in me kind of, kind of mm. clicked and that's where a lot of things start going good. Yeah, so Schrader is uh, Schrader is 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 one of those icons in our sport, and I think um, he's as famous on the racetrack as he is off the racetrack. So did you did you learn anything from Schrader that I that, learned a lot? Yeah, that, I always that, knew that, that I, we need to note here today that, I always that might knew be, if, uh, everybody has a Schrader story. I knew if he was at the racetrack, I just had to find <laughs> his suburban, and I could get a refreshment anytime. All <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. He'd always kept them stocked. So yeah, a lot of good stories, man. Um, I got to spend time with him out in, in Missouri, uh, out here when he, when he had the race team out here. Um, he's, you know, invited us and let me stay on his couch when we come out here to, to, you know, explore North Carolina, know more about asphalt and NASCAR racing. Just was a very inviting individual and, and really he's opened legend. doors for me. He's he a, is legend. a legend for sure. He, he, he took me dirt racing for the first time and he said, Kevin, just follow me. I said, okay. I'm going to follow you in, in the modified. We were at uh, the smallest racetrack I've ever been to on earth. And I, Macon. Macon, Macon yeah. Illinois. Oh, I love that place. Yeah, we went, we yeah. went to Macon, Illinois. And Schrader that is said, a tiny place Schrader said just follow me. And I'm nervous. I'm so nervous because um, I, I hadn't done much dirt racing. He said, just, just stay close. I said, okay. So we go out on the racetrack and, and I make pack in the track and make a few laps. The next thing you know, they throw the green. And I have this much mud on Kate my nose Don, and yeah. I can't pull tear. every time I pull a tear off he just he'll gas it up and the next thing I know I'm out of tear offs and I had to I, I couldn't practice because I had so much mud on my helmet that my head was hanging down like this and oh, he yeah. thought he thought that was he thought that was the funniest thing in the world Man. so he, tear offs right I mean yeah it takes you back I haven't raced dirt in a while but yeah I mean just the, the, why not it's ah, a good question I can barely keep up with what I'm doing that's probably a lot of it 
with I, with just life in general? Yeah, I, I'd say Bo for me keeps not. you busy. Well, I mean, I I would love to spend more time with them than I am. So if I could find a way to, I guess, shorten the week up some, right? I don't know if I go. I, I'd want to go race dirt, but I feel like I already don't spend enough time yeah. with my family as I should. So that to me is priority number one. Because I feel like you know, on days like this. Um, Maybe not necessarily days like last week was was pretty hectic, right? There was a lot going on. I was out of the door Wednesday night, miss you know, not seeing him Thursday, Friday, yeah. Saturday. So, um, yeah, just the weeks are short when you do this stuff, and there's a lot that you kind of need to go through to be fully prepared. So I've just been trying to wait out, wait it out, I guess, and and see, you know, get get a year, maybe two years into this, and and see how my preparation level is doing. How quickly can I get prepared? And if if I can have time to go do that other stuff, I will. But what would you race first? Mm. Or what would, if you said right now, I'm going to go dirt racing this year, what, what would you say? This is, this is what I want to do. Is it sprint car images? Would you, what tour would you follow? Or where, where would, that's a tricky one. I mean, I, I shouldn't put you on the spot for the tour. That, that's not, that's not a fair question. Which tour do? Yeah. The, the, the world of outlaws or the high limit stuff on the, well, on the I mean, cars. I, I ran non wing sprint cars and never ran a wing car. So it's, it's unfamiliar territory. I've always wanted to drive one. I haven't yet. Um, but like, you know, I had, had some experience in midgets and, and non-wing 410s and then the late models, obviously. Chili like Bowl? It, Chili Bowl? That would, that would that'd be a, it's at a good time, right? That one would kind of yeah. make sense. But uh, yeah, I haven't done it in a long time. Every, the last two times I did it when I, I mean, gosh, probably 10, 12 years ago, I would be going into the practice night, just all the rest in the world and just trying yeah. to figure it out on the qualifying night. So I just, if I'm gonna do it, I wanna be prepared. I know how much preparation helps me on the cup side, right? Yeah. So that's why I've kind of made sure if I'm gonna go venture out that I'm fully prepared for it instead of trying to knock rust off when I should be competing, you know? 24 hours of Daytona? That's another bucket list one. It's not dirt though. But, I know, but, but that's another I, one I'm for just, sure. I, I think that a guy like, a guy like you that, that raced so many different, has raced so many different things and, and I, think, I think you have the ability to, you have the ability to do whatever you want. That's what's, I think people don't really, put all that together with you because of the fact that you are one of the most diverse drivers in the, in the whole sport, whether it's dirt, asphalt, late mall. I mean, you've, you've done so many things. And I think, um, to me, when I watch the, like the 24 hours a day tone, I wish more of you guys would go do that. And, but I know it comes down to time and, and all the things that, that come with that, because I think it just makes our stars shine so much more because you guys are good road racers, you guys are good dirt racers, you're good at cup cars, Xfinity cars, trucks. You can, you can go race late models anywhere in the country. And I think, um, I don't know, it's just, it's interesting to me that you raced as much as you did. And then we have Larson who races two, three days a week, comes yeah. and races the cup car, or we'll race a truck or Xfinity car and just races all the time. And, and, and you were, you were kind of in that, on that same path to do all that. I just, um, I just, I think you could, I think you could do whatever you want, but. Yeah, I get a little I, jealous I, seeing all the racing yeah. he gets to do and we'll see. Yeah. Hopefully in the future, I can pull myself away from this enough without hurting my performance yeah. on Sunday. Well, as you get more embedded in it, in your, in your team, I think that time will come. So um, let's talk about your team and your organization because your organization, having Michael Jordan, having Denny Hamlin, you got Bubba as a teammate, High profile, everything. I, I, I mean, I see it in your shoes. I mean, you yes, sir. These aren't even out for like another month and a half, I think. So. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's a nice perk as well. That is a really nice perk. You guys have badass shoes. So, but when you look at your new shop and you look at high profile everything, that has to be an advantage for the employees and the people and being able to attract good people. Is that Absolutely. is that fair to say? Yeah, it was. It's the last year I'd say has been pretty wild just for me honestly i can only imagine for those that have been there since day one but to go from the facility we were using in, was in it marsville i mean it wasn't i wouldn't say it was bad it was just like it reminded me of like the humble beginnings that like brax Lossy racing had to begin with you know you. where we were operating out of that tiny shop then brad built this beautiful building up in statesville we moved in there and it was the it was just such a mode uh, such a huge boost for for everyone involved and yeah i mean i was i was just there this morning you know, in, in a meeting there and just the facility we have now, it's not like fully complete yet open mm -hmm. to the public, but it's, we're up and running functional. Right. And it's just, I mean, for me, it's just such a 
awesome home to have. I mean, I've been in many shops and you probably have too, where you walk in and it's just bright white lights, no sun. You don't know where you're at. Don't know yeah. what time of day it is. There's windows all around this building. It's a lot of natural light and Denny and, and the whole group got really creative with, with the layout of the building and just making it, you know, it's not necessarily about feeling different, but just being like a, a warm, just welcoming, inviting, um, clean environment. And, um, yeah, the layout's really, really nice. I feel like it's a big shop, but you can really get anywhere you want to in the building very quickly. So in the gift shop, can you buy shoes? We haven't got the gift shop set okay. up yet. Well, we gotta, be, we gotta get the gift shop set up so that, so that we can buy shoes. How many shoes do you have in your collection now? Uh, I think- Now, wait a recent. second. Are, is that on purpose or did you wake up? No, that's on purpose, yeah. Okay, that's how it's supposed to be, different different. Color I mean, you just do whatever you want. I, I, I think they, uh, they both came out of the box with black laces. I just wanted to do something different with them. Okay. What? I mean, I mean, they're not out for a while, so I guess you can kind of, you know, have at it, figure it out. Someone, someone will wear them a certain way and maybe that'll be the thing. But for me, uh, I don't know. I just, it came with three sets of laces. I figured I might as well switch it so up a little bit. So how many shoes? How, how, do you know how many shoes you have in your collection now? And it's still a small so wait, collection. So let's, let's back up before, before pre-23XI. Yeah. How many shoes, were you a shoe guy? Did you have a lot of shoes? I mean, I had some, but like, when you grow up racing dirt and spend all that time dirt racing, right? I, I'd been asphalt Don't racing. Don't tell me you were a Crocs, hose them off type of guy. I wasn't, that's, it was even worse than that. I think oh when, I, when I was dirt racing, I would just wear flip flops. Jeez. It was just, you know I mean? Like it's easy to walk, like hose them down, like you said, right? Uh, I wore flip flops a lot working on cars and that's a pretty bold move. Yeah. And it backfired on me one day. I about chopped my uh, big toe off of my left foot <laughs> in the, uh, the, rear, uh, the rear door of uh, our s, &S hauler. Um, so that was the, the end of my flip flop era. But so yeah, we, I wore the nastiest we were, shoes you could. We were not, you were not a shoe guy. I liked them, but you didn't. You didn't have them. I had a couple, but they sat in my closet because I was always on the road. You know what I mean? We right. go on the road for three or four months, three or four months at a time, and there was no point. Anything, anything that was in our living area of our hauler, yeah. just with how much you're in and out throughout a race weekend or a day, everything's covered in dirt. Everything's dirty. Yeah. So you're just, I mean. You're not even worried about, I mean, it never made sense to have anything super nice on, on, on our hauler because we were always rolling around in the dirt, getting covered in grease and mud and all that stuff. So you haven't answered my question. How many shoes do you have in your collection now? Collection now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I was getting to that. Yeah, you were. I think, uh, I think I was up, I think the recent shipments got me up to 77, 70. 72, 72. Sorry. So it, can you wear the same pair of shoes to the racetrack? Or do you have a new pair for every week? I kind of mix it up. I have a couple favorites. I'd say my favorite pair um, that I wear most of the time, just because they're very, very durable. I even wore them to the Bristol Dirt Race for my um, Travis Scott Phantoms. They're okay. like an all black shoe. It has some white stitching, but the material of the stitching is not very like, it's very hard to stay. So we went from hosing off, we went from hosing off our flip flops to knowing the stitching color in shoes once you went. Well, I mean, it's, the whole shoe is black except the stitching. It's white, so yeah. it kind of sticks out. Yeah. on that pair but that's like probably the pair i wear the most i I've, i enjoy if you know i'm running the beast car having a shoe that's got some green in it you yeah. know with the nasty beast car i've enjoyed wearing like my uh yellow lightnings that's kind of they're like a four do you know what four is i have no idea what yeah. you're talking they're about they're all jordans but okay. i mean i i do kind of like to mix it up and wear a shoe that kind of goes along with the color scheme of the weekend that sort of thing it's, is there any way that is there any way that we could come up with something that i could just totally blow Boyer away with in the booth because I, I feel like he's he's kind of challenged me with my shoes and I, I feel like I feel like I need some advice on trying to get my shoe style um, mm. up to what Boyer considers style so we need to we need to I'd we, say if, if we need to talk a little bit I mean, nope, it, you can't say it right now because then he'll go out and buy them no no I wasn't or, gonna give you specifics okay. I, th I think you just find a shoe style you like or you know a color you know a color scheme that kind of fits you. Really, I just want to give, wear. I just want to do anything that I could possibly do to bury Boyer. That's would, really, that's really I would my probably buy goal. one of the more expensive pairs you can okay. get for resale, right? All right, now. we'll talk when we yeah. get done. Um, your teammate. Yes. Bubba. I, I see, I, I know Bubba fairly well, but obviously not as well as you, as you, as you guys sit in meetings together on a weekly basis. Tell me about that relationship, how it's progressed, how it's changed. Did you know him before you got to 23, 
2311 and, and just tell me where you guys are as, as teammates. We definitely on some weekends, we're very, very aligned on driving style and approach. And then others, there's quite a bit of difference. And I wouldn't say when we are apart, it really hurts us. It probably helps us mm. because more times than not, the cars show up pretty much identical every single weekend. I mean, to, I mean, they, they go so far to the cars being the same. Um, I, th I think they, they go a step above probably what, what other teams do and being yeah. aligned. I think at Atlanta, we were within five hundredths of one another in qualifying. And um, I think in, in Vegas in practice, like that's one thing that's always really cool is as we've kind of gotten to know about each other's driving style more, it's helping us get better. But on the, on the occasions where we do drive a little bit differently, it's always really helpful that the cars are so close because Bubba's approach might be a tenth better in turns one and two. And my approach might be better in turns three and four. And we're able to compare instead of having that, well, how much difference is the balance of like my teammate's car, or this or that? There's none of that's on the table, right? Mm. It, it's, it's all the same. So you just got to adjust your driving style and do what your teammate's doing or vice versa. So that, that's been beneficial and that's not really our relationship. But between me and him, it, it's really interesting. I, I wear my results pretty heavy on my shoulder and, and you know, I take things pretty hard, right? When yeah. they don't go right. And I feel like he's a lot the same way. And it, it seems like this weekend we were both pretty, pretty crushed, right? But I feel like the way that, the way that we kind of absorb what happens throughout a race weekend, um, I guess we're, we're kind of able to help guide each other through it, if that makes sense. Yeah. On the weekends where I have a really rough weekend, he's always, he knows exactly what to say to kind of get me out of it. And when he's not, not feeling the greatest about what happened, I feel like we're able to talk about it and, and, and get some conclusions out of it. For yeah, sure. I, I think the dynamic of the NASCAR teammate, it varies from, from team to team, but it seems like you guys genuinely care about yes. each other I mean, and the I results. certainly, you know, I feel like I've had great relationships with other teammates throughout the years and yeah. other organizations I've been a part of. Um, but I feel like we really do go out of our, our way to communicate with each other, whether it's like, you know, when I've went out there and in, in qualifying and been way ahead of him, you know, I'm straight to him, giving him feedback. If there's something of benefit that can help his lap. Um, and he's doing the same thing. And I mean, it goes, it goes even further than that. I think we just, we have really good conversations and we're able to really relate a lot with what our cars are doing. And I think our team's mindset really helps us be able to be on the same page and, and communicate like that. And then even beyond that, right. I feel like as teammates, there is a time and a place where we will race each other hard, but I feel like when we know one is better than the other or, or someone's needing the spot more than the other, we do a really good job of just being good teammates. I mean, what he was able to help me with at Vegas was huge. You know, I've been able to kind of help him and, and guard his back at times too. And uh, it's just a good relationship. Are there any pranks? You guys give each other hard time? He does give me a hard time, but no pranks. Um, by the way, I'm still, whole, I know I it's know, coming. I know you're going to walk into your locker one weekend and your shield's going to have tape on the back of it or uh, I only have one shield. Your so. shoes are, you only have one shield. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, your shoes are going to be backwards or stuffed with something like it's, I was honestly, it's I was when I, when I, when I brought these in today, I was honestly wondering, I'm like, was he going to do something with my shoes? That yeah. would have been, it would have been a great opportunity. Cause I can't, I can't get another pair of these for a while. It would have been a great opportunity. So is that like a, is that like an order or do they just say, Hey, these are coming? You kind of just, I mean, as of right now, anyways, it just stuff. I don't even know when stuff's going to show up. Sometimes yeah. I'll come home and my neighbors called and said, Hey, there's like, you know, a pile of boxes in, in the driveway <laughs> and we we're going to, yeah. we're gone, you know, the weekend. Right. And yeah. so I'm asking my neighbor to please put all my stuff in the house so it doesn't go missing and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, whenever I get shipments of, of these shoes, like the, the people that are delivering them to the house, I always get a little worried because when they get delivered, I mean, the people have opened the boxes, they're looking through them. They're, I, I get worried sometimes that like a pair or two go missing, but it hasn't happened yet. That's so good. I always get worried when they get delivered that they're all gonna be there or not. So let's talk about Bo. Um, you grew up racing. Is, is that something that, do you want him to race? Does he show any interest in, in racing? He's, he's got a lot of interest in a lot of things right now. I'm yeah. just trying to better understand it. Like he, he really does love racing. He, he also loves baseball. I mean, he, he's just a kid. Like he really yeah. likes a lot of things. And um, I think for me, just trying to like figure out, you know, what, 
what he really wants to do. I mm -hmm. don't I don't want to like I don't want to push it on him. So I'm just kind of waiting it out. The, the interesting twist in all of this is like, you know, he's four now and here in a couple months, that's when I started racing, you know, right. when I was like four and a half years old. And and my dad's asking me more and more often as as we speak, right? Like, when are we gonna get him in a cart? When are we, when are we gonna do this? And I'm just, I think I just, I, I, want it, I want him to decide he wants to do it. So is he playing baseball, t-ball, anything right now? I mean, like he's done a couple, I think he did like a soccer camp last year. Yeah. Um, like he, he likes being active and outdoors. Um, he loves any chance he can to jump on our little like electric go-kart and go make laps, um, like so throwing balls. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible coach. Like I'm, I, my I brain, I, I've, my brain I'm not flips. Great at it okay. <laughs> so you're the same way. I feel like, I'm, yeah, I, I talk to him like he's a, a 15 year old kid. Yeah. Uh, especially when it comes to driving. Alexa was like, just stop and just let him go out there and figure it out. Not possible. Yeah. It's not possible. Yeah. It, so at the at like the little soccer camp, you're like, hey man, you should have knocked that kid over if he does that to you again. I was just, not very athletic growing up, yeah. so I, I have nothing to say about that. She's more along those lines. She she knows how to. I, th I feel like she approached it really well because um, her mom was pretty tough on her with sports. Mm -hmm. um, so she kind of remembers that, right? I remember how tough my dad was on me, but here I am, you know, still kind of like the same way. So right. I don't You're going to be just like your dad and your dad's going to be the total opposite that he was to you, yes. to, to Bo. Because yes. yes, he has been. It's, it's, yes. It, absolutely. You're like, what, the, what in the world? Why? What, where was this? Convenient. Yeah. You know, yeah. my dad was very, very strict, but, but Hey, I mean, it, it obviously worked. I turned out okay. Yeah. Last minute. So he was pretty strict on you. I think so. Yeah. yeah I mean, it too. felt that way, uh, especially with the racing stuff. I mean, if I missed the bottom by a hair, I'd come in and I'd hear about it. You know, we, Especially as I got older, I started to have my own opinions on setup and, and all this and that. And it would just always boil over, right? Like he yeah. he just did it for so long. It was his way or the highway. And that's, you know, so he just, raced too? He did a little bit. Um, like he grew up running um, like, I mean, you would call it motocross today, but it was like um, outdoor national type stuff before okay. motocross was really, really big back in like the 60s, late 60s and 70s, I think. They grew up on two wheels and then for fun. When I was really, really little, he kind of scrapped some money together to go race at Shasta and ran it when Shasta. it was dirt, ran it when it was asphalt. Many times I've snuck into the pits at Shasta and would watch my dad race or watch them have trailer races and, and whatever it was at Shasta Speedway. I raced there one time. It was the only Southwest Tour race that I ran that never had a caution. I think it took like 21 minutes to run really? 100 laps. It did not take, it did not take very long. So. Everything from your shoes to your paint scheme to the way you talk, the way you act, the way you drive screams confident. Tell us, tell us how you got to that point because it seemed like Xfinity kind of shy, didn't want to say anything wrong. And now it's like, you're going to tell what you feel. You're going to show up and you're going to look good. You know, your cars are going to show up and look good. You just have that, this extreme confidence from, from what I see and swagger to go with it. I feel like when Next Gen Racing came into our sport, right? For me, that was like a great reset button for, for myself because the, all the years of knowledge that drivers like you and others had built up around the Gen 6 car and just knowing the feel of that race car and, and having the experience that you did at a number of racetracks, right? All that, for the most part, got reset for a while. Yeah. And for me, just coming into that first year with that car, my confidence was sky high right from that that point and then um yeah as we went through the process of figuring out where i was going to be in the in the in the future um i ended up coming 23 or 23 11 a year early but i knew just as a competitor of theirs when i was at rcr that they were bringing really fast race cars to the racetrack it wasn't always working out right they're building and getting there but i knew uh pretty much right from the get-go when we we did the tire test for toyota uh, my first laps in a Toyota Camry at, at Coda. We went out there and the handling of it's the fast. car was just there, right? Yeah. You know, we had to work on the speed a little bit at the real courses mm -hmm. um, then, but it just, I could just tell, you know, just the effort that TRD Toyota puts into it, um, you know, the knowledge that the 2311 has, has grown with their relationship with Joe Gibbs Racing has really gotten them out of the gate. And I just could feel that consistency week in and week out, right? There was, there was times with RCR we could, 
hit it and be really fast. And there's yeah. weekends we missed it and we were going to be run 15th. Right. And I feel like genuinely every weekend with, with 2311, especially that first year, we were capable of getting a top 10 out of every single weekend. Obviously we didn't, but that yeah. capability was pretty much there week in and week out. And that for me really helped build my confidence. So you mentioned Coda. Yes. How did that happen? Because I don't ever remember you even doing very good on the road courses. And it's like all of a sudden, well, I mean, you, you went to work you and the next the thing you the, know, you're a world you know beater. The, you know what the tipping point was? Is I was at the Roval a couple, you know, a couple years ago now, probably, I guess it would have been 2020, right? Yeah. And you're, you had some sort of issue. You're trying to come back through the field and I'm just lost out there trying to go in the backstretch chicane. And I think I'm at the breaking zone, right? And I break so early. You like ass back me. I think it destroyed your radiator and like if i hit you you were breaking way too early it destroyed <laughs> your race car, that, right yeah. i mean i'm back here running 30th just in everybody's way and i'm like man i've like you're racing you know you're in the playoffs trying to make something out of the year right and it, here i am messing messing your race up and, and just in the way of others and so for me um i just was like i've got to do something and so i just put in a lot of work in the off season uh What'd you do? Where'd you go? Simulators, cars. You know, hopped in some different race cars, went and ran laps at, at racetracks. Did did some racing at, at Coda actually too, endurance racing. Mm. So I just that was my sole focus in the winter, and we just worked on it all winter long, um, a lot of time on it. And um, we we went to the the clash, which was on the Daytona Road Course mm -hmm. that year. And I mean, I remember firing off in that race, and if I wouldn't have. Uh, What's the term? It doesn't happen in the next gen cars really anymore. Um, Wheel hop? Glaze my rotors. I think oh, that's yeah. the term. I think I, I like cooked them. I like, I think I had them at like 600 degrees or something just under the pace laps. Just got them too hot and burned them up. Then we had that quick mm. caution. Aside from that happening, when we went to that, that first race back on the, at the clash there, I mean, we were right in the mix the whole, whole weekend long. And I think the whole, whole night long. So for me, just seeing that huge bump just gave me confidence when we came rolling back into Coda for, for qualifying and everything and being able to get that pole is like a huge accomplishment. It really solidified for me, okay, like we figured it out, we've got it, we know what we need to work on. I know how to attack a road course now and I know what I need my race car to do to go fast. So it was just, it was really rewarding to put in all that time and effort into it um, and see the results like we did. And now you feel like you can go to any, every road course you go to, you, the expectation eh, is to- Sonoma, I was, in, I mean, Sonoma for me has always been, and Watkins Glen, honestly, really? those two still. I mean, it's just more about momentum, I think. Sonoma was a tricky one. I feel like it would always be okay there. And then as the car would like fade away, I couldn't quite figure out what I needed to do mm. uh, with my car or communicate with my team what I needed to do to go faster, uh, being it's momentum based. But now it's gonna be repaid. New asphalt. I should be okay. You should be good I should now. be good there. Watkins Glen's been a tricky one. Like I feel okay at Watkins Glen. I can run okay laps most of the time, but I think just, you know, I think I always struggle to back up turn, um, I think it's turn nine, right? Coming on the front stretch. Mm -hmm. I always struggle to back that corner up enough and um, just, it's hard to tell yourself to just go all out through the carousel yeah. or the bus stop every single time with as much your head's jarring around. That's a, that's a tough section for me. Yeah. Tell me your season in one word. How would you describe it so far? You only get one. <laughs> one word? One word. Man. How would you describe your season so far? I mean, it's stressful. Stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would tell you that from the outside looking in, you have a fast car, you have a great team, you have fancy looking shoes, and you guys are going to win a lot of races. So I'd say. That's why it's stressful. Uh, well, we got to win. It, stressful. Winning is stressful. So you guys are in position to, to do what you need to do. So. Thanks for taking the time today. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks. Is this is this your little little spot here? No, this is. Uh, I, I don't have anything that um, I pick out myself. I've learned in TV to just stand back and and let them do all do all the stuff that requires some sort of uh, style. So anything that has style. You don't I get have, to decorate your house either. No. Yeah, I'm the same boat. You don't, That's okay though. Yeah, we we, we literally just exist <laughs> at home. Yeah. Our houses sound very similar. <laughs> awesome. Well, we appreciate Tyler Reddick uh, taking the time to, to sit down and do that interview with us. I hope it gave you a little insight to who, who Tyler Reddick is. We think he's one of our bright stars here in NASCAR. Thank you for har uh, following Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour presented by NASCAR on Fox. Follow us uh, on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcast. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next Tuesday.